afternoon and good evening, uh, everyone, and thank you for joining us today at this webinar. Uh, my name is Bob Fay. I'm the Managing Director of uh, Digital Economy Research at the Centre for International Governance Innovation in Canada. And uh, we're pleased to host this event with uh, a number of great institutions, um, IDRC Canada, the International Development Research Centre, the Digital Trade and Data Governance Hub at George Washington University, the Internet and Policy Jurisdiction Network and their Data Sphere Initiative, the GovLab at uh, New York University, and of course, UNCTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. So the purpose of today's seminar is to hear the highlights of the UNCTAD Digital Economy Report uh, that was recently released. And it's a very comprehensive report. I think it's a must read for policymakers in developed and developing countries. Um, so let me just very briefly sketch out how we're going to run this webinar, and then I'm going to turn the floor over. So um, we will um, hear from Torburn Fredrickson who's from UNCAD, who will provide highlights of the report. And then we have four experts who will share their views on the report, and we will have a Q&A session. You'll see in the chat, uh, please enter your questions as they come to your mind, and I will, um, and I will introduce some. Uh, when I when I have the opportunity. Um, this event is being recorded. It will be posted on our website and YouTube channel within 24 to 20, 24 to 48 hours. There is simultaneous interpretation for this event and you'll see the button at the bottom of the screen. And okay, we have a lot to, to do in, in an hour. So let me turn the floor over right now to Aaron Tanzi who is the director of IDRC Sustainable Inclusive Economies Program. She brings over 20 years of experience in international development and the humanitarian sectors within Canada and international non-governmental organizations. So uh, Aaron, the floor is yours, please. Thanks so much, Bob. You can hear me well? Great. Well, thank you. And uh, it's really my pleasure and honor to welcome you to this meeting on uh, digital economy today. Um, my name is Erin Tanzi, as Bob just said, and I'm the director of IDRC's Sustainable Inclusive Economies Division. I'm speaking to you from Ottawa, Canada, where IDRC's head office is located. Uh, I'd like to just begin by acknowledging that the land on which we are based is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. So I'd like to thank our co-hosts for offering IDRC this opportunity to organize this together and engage with our audience on this key theme. Thank you to UNCTAD and CG and Torbjorn Fredrickson and Bob Fay in particular. Um, and I don't wanna to talk too much because I know there's a lot to, to, to cover today, but I, um, I want to be able to turn over to my expert colleagues as soon as possible. Um, but I do want to say just a few words about why this report and this discussion is important to, um, to IDRC from our perspective. So many of you might know IDRC, just to, for those that, uh, that don't, uh, we are the International Development Research Centre. We're part of uh, the Canadian government, we're a crown corporation, and we support researchers in the Global South to help address some of the most pertinent de development, uh, development problems. Our new 10-year strategy called Strategy 2030 um, is aligned um, very specifically with the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN SDGs, with really a particular focus on the growing, uh, growing climate crisis and um, on the deep inequalities that mark uh, global and local economies but also with a, a, a more, even more specific emphasis on gender equality, um, partially inspired by Canada's feminist foreign policy. So my, my program, our program, the Sustainable Inclusive Economies Team, we support research and evidence uh, that can help economies be both more sustainable and more inclusive. So for example, um, looking at evidence um, that, uh, on, on employment for marginalized groups, in sectors and activities that are resilient to climate change and help the decarbonization of economies. Data, the availability and sharing of data, of course, is key to many, and in fact, if not all, the SDGs. And obviously then it's also very important to us at IDRC. 
And as the UNCTAD report really stresses, data have become an increasingly important economic and strategic resource. So for instance, data is crucial to demonstrate progress and attractiveness and in investments in developing countries and regions. It's needed for national planning and for resource allocation in ways that spread the benefits of growth across communities. So more and more economists, investors, and decision makers want, really want to leverage digitalization and use real time data to understand what's going on in a very complex and dynamic context that changing. The report re uh, really provides an excellent description of the recent global trends in the data driven digital economy and how data is central to solving the world's most pressing problems. So perhaps not surprisingly, the governance and the rules and regulations of this resource and its flows have sort of lagged behind, uh, behind the development of this sort of global, global market, if you will. So the report reviews existing data governance approaches, both at national, regional, and also even at multilateral levels. And it calls for innovative governance approaches that reflect the multiple dimensions of data and balance different interests and needs in a way that supports inclusive and sustainable development with full participation of all countries. So the key questions today that you, that you will be um, talking about are really, you know, what are the most important issues that developing countries face in governance of the data-driven economy? And how can voices and concerns of developing countries be reflected in the development of global governance of data and cross-border data flows. So I'm now gonna give the floor over to Torbjorn uh, for his presentation of the report, followed by the panel moderated by Bob. So um, just to, to say that I think I, I think Bob may have mentioned, but Torbjorn is the, is the head of the e-commerce and digital uh, economy branch at the UN Conference on Trade and Development. And more details about him and his background will be posted in the chat if they haven't been already. So, Mr. Fredrickson, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Erin. And uh, let me just start by checking that you can see the screen that I'm sharing. Thank you. So, um, let me start by thanking CG and partners for organizing this event with us. Uh, uh, we have very much appreciated the collaboration with Bob and many other colleagues when we were making the, the report. Uh, I'm also very happy that a number of the people who participated in a peer review session that we organized uh, last February on the report are also in this session. Uh, it's great to see you all again. Uh, the Digital Economy Report was launched about six weeks ago and uh, it is, as you now know, devoted to the topic of cross-border uh, data flows and development. And as was also mentioned by Bob, it's quite a comprehensive and dense report, more than 200 pages. And uh, with my introduction, I will just try to bring out some of the key observations and messages that we, that we uh, emphasize in the report. And as a starting point then, uh, is that the data are increasingly economically and strategically important for countries, for uh, businesses and for organizations. Um, and uh, because it is so cross-cutting, it's penetrating the entire society and economy, uh, how we deal with data, how we handle data from a governance perspective will uh, greatly influence our ability to achieve the sustainable development goals. If we do it well, it can help us achieve them. If we do it badly, it may make it much more difficult to achieve the SDGs. And data flows are growing very fast, as you, you're familiar with. We have seen some, some estimates suggest that in 2022 alone, internet protocol traffic will be as big or bigger than all the internet traffic that we have seen up until 2016. Uh, so it continues to grow very fast and we expect that with the rollout of uh, 5G technology and the increased use of Internet of Things, uh, it will just continue to expand very fast. And the, big, uh, the biggest routes uh, through which the data flows are traveling in the world are between North America and Europe and between North America and Asia and especially with China. And this is happening now against the backdrop of still very wide divides 
uh, in the digital readiness of countries and different stakeholders. We still know that only one in five people in the least developed countries use the internet. And when they do, it's typically at a less fast speed and uh, typically more costly, uh, especially if you relate the costs to the income levels than in other countries. There are two front runners that are particularly good at harnessing data right now in the world. And these are the two countries of the United States and China. And we see that half of the world's hyperscale data centers are in these countries. We observe the highest rates of 5G adoption in the world in these two countries. More than 94% of all funding of artificial intelligence startups takes place in these two countries. And 90% of the market capitalization of the world's largest digital platforms also relate to these two countries. And of course, the digital platforms are particularly well positioned to take advantage of data. And uh, we have seen that they have grown increasingly important uh, during the pandemic, uh, largely because as we around the world have looked for digital solutions to dealing with the pandemic, uh, most of the solutions are provided by a small number of very large players. So what we're seeing in the report is that the digital platforms, they have become increasingly important and increasingly dominant throughout the global data value chain, not just in terms of collecting data through their various user-centric interfaces, but also in terms of transmission of data, storage of data, processing of data, as well as the use of data. And this has global implications. And I just wanted to include two snippets here of how we see this uh, actually having a big impact in, in, in the global economy. The right-hand panel here, it just looks at the share of the top five platforms in terms of um, revenue from digital advertising and their share in total revenue from digital ad advertising. And you can see that their share has gone from about 50% in 2015 to more than 70% in 2021. We, and the trajectory is still going up. So it has of course implications for uh, other companies that would like to leverage this business model for their activities. But I was also saying that data, uh, the, the platforms are also important in terms of the use of data. And one very important use of data is to develop good algorithms and develop artificial intelligence. And it's quite a stunning chart, the one to the left, I think, that you see that the top three institutions for top tier AI research in terms of the number of scientific papers uh, published in 2020 uh, are Google, Stanford University, and MIT. And Google produced as many articles as MIT and Stanford University together. And you will go down that list and you will find a number of the other platforms. Now, why data are complicated to deal with is that they are so multidimensional. There are both economic dimensions and non-economic dimensions. And the, in the economic case, you have both private value creation from data and you have social value creation. And it's very, that's why they have come up as a very important issue now when we think about how we can leverage data for dealing with the pandemic, uh, speed up the production of vaccines, or dealing with climate change uh, and many other development challenges that we're facing. The data are core in this context. And non-economic dimensions that are very important in this case relate to privacy and other human rights. Uh, security issues, law enforcement, and so on and so forth. And this makes it important for us uh, and for policymakers to understand uh, what are the key issues that we need to address. And I just list a few here on the right-hand side of this chart. Then if we look around the world, as we do in this report, we see that the approach taken by different parts of the world in terms of governing data and data flows varies a lot. So just uh, somewhat simplified here, you could say that in the United States, uh, there's approach uh, reliant on the control of data by the private sector. In the European Union, you have the control of data by individuals. And in China, the control of data by the government. Of course, these are simplified uh, descriptions, but the point here is not really that one is in one way or another. The point is that they are very different. And if you add to other, add other major players in the digital economy, they will add additional models of uh, data governance. 
And the concern here we identify is, of course, there is a risk of fragmentation of the digital space and even on the functioning of the internet if we just continue on this uh, trajectory. We see a very strong race for leadership in the technological developments to gain economic and strategic advantages, which very much is anchored in how uh, different parts of the world can take advantage of data. And this is also generating a lot of tension right now among the major players. In parallel with the way that governments are dealing with this, we see that the global digital platforms are evolving their own uh, approaches to dealing with data. Clearly, in view of the very different uh, position that countries are when it comes to digital readiness, it's very hard to see that there would be ever a one size fits all approach to regulating cross border data flows. The approaches that we identify in the report, they reflect differences in terms of technological, political, uh, social, economic, cultural, and institutional circumstances in each, each country. They are also uh, trying, the, the regulations are trying to achieve different objectives. It could be to promote economic development, to protect privacy and other human rights, to secure effective law enforcement, or to consider national security. And when we look at the, the legal instruments that different countries are using to achieve these various objectives, it spans a wide range of policy areas from data protection, cybersecurity, state secrets, taxation, and even accounting rules. We have also seen a growing appearance of data flow uh, provisions in various international and regional agreements dealing with data flows. And um, many of them in, in the recent past have been related to trade regimes, various trade agreements, but there are also, of course, uh, and even dating further back, various agreements and initiatives related to uh, other areas, such as the OECD privacy guidelines, um, the digital economy partnership agreements, and uh, more recently also the discussion within the G20 on the data free flow with trust. But even though there has been more attention to data flows in these international agreements, we draw the conclusion that, that uh, the existing regional in international re regulatory frameworks tend to be either too narrow in scope or too limit limited geographically. In fact, especially the least developed countries and the, and the low income countries of the world are uh, typically not very well uh, covered in these efforts. So what the report is calling for is the need to uh, develop a more balanced global approach to data governance that works for both the people and the planet. And ultimately, we would like to see an approach that enables data to flow as freely as necessary and possible across borders, but without um, reducing the ability to address various development objectives. Uh, including both to minimize harms, but also to harness the development opportunities. And we think it's very important in, in this context also to think about the development implications uh, from a distributional perspective. Uh, as I indicated uh, in, in earlier slides, there is a tendency right now in having an agglomeration of market power and also in revenue collection from data that uh, uh, tends to go further and further in one direction and which may not be uh, totally sustainable uh, as we move forward. We also need to find a way that avoids these extreme positions, polarized position, where you either think about very free data flows with hardly any re uh, restrictions or very strict uh, data localization approaches. We need to find it a uh, balanced approach. And we see that there is a need to look at a number of uh, key areas just to develop a more common uh, language when we deal with data flows. Uh, there is not currently a universal agreement on definitions and taxonomies. Um, there is a need for developing uh, rights and principles, develop standards, uh, and also to uh, consider how we can best deal with data as a public good. We have in the report pointed to the fact that if we want to have a really inclusive process, we think the UN needs to play a very important role because this is the most universal platform that we have 
to enable as many countries at all levels of development to participate in the discussions. And there is a need for a lot of discussion. We need to understand what we're doing. We need to understand what's going on. And we need to really explore different trajectories for finding good solutions to the situ current situation. We think it's very important that the, moving forward that we have a multilateral, multi-stakeholder and multidisciplinary approach that really factors in all the different dimensions of data. And we are not really specifying exactly how this should be done, but we think it's important to start the dialogue as soon as possible. And the, we have flagged the possibility uh, or the possible need for a new UN coordinating body for no other reasons but to bring the various UN agencies together and talk about data in one place. And, but it's very important that this coordinating body has a strong mandate to really focus on the data and the various development implications and also has the right skills. This is a very complex material and you need to have a very um, good combination of various skills to actually find solutions in this area. Of course, it cannot be only the UN. It has to be a multi-stakeholder approach with all the relevant stakeholders uh, participating in the process. And I'm very happy also that there are so many interesting initiatives that are coming up now that are going more or less in the same direction. And uh, I think what is common to all of this is that we all struggle to know for sure exactly how to move forward, but we need to work together in the hope of finding a better solution. The report is available. Uh, for download, and uh, I will be very happy to participate in the discussion as we move forward. Thank you so much. Great, thank you uh, very much, Torbjorn. And um, you know, you said it's a dense report, and it almost gives the sense that it's it's not not readable, but it's eminently readable. It's a very very well drafted report, and uh, I really do hope people go and uh, who haven't taken a look at it, do so. Okay, so now we're gonna open up, uh, we're now gonna have a panel discussion and I'm gonna introduce each speaker as, uh, as it's their turn to, um, to speak. And I see Susan Aronson has come up on the screen. She is our first speaker. She is a research professor of international affairs and cross-disciplinary fellow at George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs, where she directs the Digital Trade and Data Governance Hub. And she's also a senior fellow at CG. So Susan, the floor is yours. Yeah. Hi, everybody. And thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, my only problem is I can, ah, there's the share screen. Okay. Hopefully you can see my screen now. You can see them. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, so I appreciate this opportunity to talk about what are the most important issues that countries face in the governance of data. And to me, there's a lack of data about data governance. The truth is we really don't know how to govern data because it's something different. And the report points that out frequently. Um, we have good anecdotal evidence of what seems to be working for the UK as example but we don't really understand what works and we need more empirical analysis to understand what is the appropriate mix of data governance for uh, various types of countries that have various types of data. Okay, so that's issue one. Issue two, how do you govern government use of, of personal data when the focus is on private sector use? So we examine um, at the hub, we map the governance of data around the world, and we found an awful lot of nations uh, exclude or exempt government from rules governing personal data. How do you facilitate data sharing and mixing of data among various sectors of society if you want to use data to solve wicked problems? How can we gain greater control over private sector use and reuse of metadata? when the firm gains control over the use and reuse once they use a trade secret and algorithms generally, firms use algorithms to protect trade secrets. Okay, another issue, digital trade, which is the main um, strategy by which nations govern cross-border data flows. Those rules definitely need clarifications because nations rely on the exceptions and obviously, in order to do that, we need more trade disputes, but alas, um, the, WT, the United States has gutted the dispute settlement system. 
but let's talk about that another day, if you don't mind. Um, these trade agreements generally ban only two types of behavior, two types of trade barriers, data localization and performance requirements. This is insane. Um, internet shutdowns, as example, impede. I don't have empirical evidence of it, but because they occur so frequently, that obviously does more to reduce market access than, let's say, data localization. We also need to look at censorship and competition policies that can distort trade. We need to ask, do digital trade agreements truly build trust in data flows? Where is the evidence for that? And, and then this misuse of data sovereignty. You and I are sovereign over our personal data, right? Because it's about us and the notion of autonomy and sovereignty, we really need to explore these things more. Finally, um, Torchborn hinted at this in his remarks. Um, how can the voices and concerns of developing countries be best reflected? I also think we need to have the people be heard, not just the people in the developing world, but the people around the world. The process, so here's another thing that the hub has mapped and we have found, yes, many nations have public uh, hearings related to their data governance, but they don't go beyond informing or simple consultations. They don't include collaboration. And that is the internet governance model. And somehow it is lost in data governance. Um, uh, public uh, governments need to show the public that they have been heard and, and that policies were revised in regard to public comment, whether that's social you know, content moderation, whether it's a ban of certain apps, et cetera. And then finally, if you really care about developing countries, when you sign digital trade agreements, nations should focus on capacity building. Okay, I think I've taken my five minutes, right? If I have one more minute, I, I'd like to yeah, go say ahead. some things about this. Um, okay, so I am very concerned that we all yap on and on about data flows relying on proxies. And we really don't know very much. We need to be honest about that. Also, I would argue that um, the report argues that um, those who have economies of scale in, in data can also achieve or maintain technological leadership I'm not sure that's true. Finally, some data can be a global public good, but certainly not all types of data. That said, this report is fabulous. And if you haven't read it, as Bob said, it's a really good read. Thanks for letting me speak. Great, thank you, Susan. Um, now we're gonna to turn to uh, Fernando Perini, who is a senior program specialist at IDRC. And there's more information on people in the chat. So I'm just going to leave it there. Fernando, the floor is yours, please. Thanks, Bob. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, congratulations to Pat for the excellent work. Indeed, an excellent report. And many thanks to CG for organizing this important debate. Um, there is really a lot to say, but when, but uh, just if I were to pick one, a few things. Uh, when reading the report, uh, one thing that came to my mind was the polarized debates that we had in digital policy uh, decades ago around the kind of the free trader, free market uh, approach, uh, and free trade, and versus the import substitution policies, and how countries in the global south should open their borders or protect themselves. Uh, in the with different barriers uh, along the way, I guess the the the, the report really makes the case uh, makes a strong case that the, the debate about uh, free flows of data or data localization is like the 21st century version of that debate. I think that uh, it, it clearly uh, is in a data driven global economy. Data flows affect uh, how we consume, how safe our digital wallets are, how we can express our freedoms, etc. So. I think that the, 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 is the fact that the data flows is kind of the 21st century, is, is core to 21st century industrial policies at the end of the day. We need to really think that, uh, and, and it, they are as important today as, as those discussions were in the 20th century, decades ago, and, and they'll continue to be more and more important. 
So of course there are many parallels and many things are different and the report really makes a great case in terms of uh, uh, pointing to where we are, examining different questions and, and, and suggest a balanced approach to move things forward. And I think that uh, it, uh, as Erin said, uh, and, and the work that we do as in IDRC in terms of building capacity in the global south in general for the last five years and more specific in terms of data and digital uh, for development, uh, this uh, idea of a balanced approach for data governance really resonates very much uh, with uh, what we have been hearing from partners around the world and the need to build an evidence base, as uh, Susan said just now, on kind of having the data, have the way to move forward beyond the, 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 the to move forward in, in this agenda. Uh, if I have to pick one thing also to highlight, I would say that uh, that's a concern for countries, a concern for people, uh, is the issue of inequality. I think that's uh, that's definitely a central element that I would emphasize as, as that we need to discuss further. Uh, we have these uh, huge inequalities in terms of uh, places that are integrated in this data-rich economy and places that are part of this data poor spaces where people still don't have uh, access to the infrastructure to participate in this complex digital economy and, and still are left behind. So we, and you need to continue to work to think about data governance on redressing some of these balances in terms of access and integration. But more importantly than just simply the access, I think that uh, uh, I think there's this is important, is important inequalities as well in terms of the data powerful and the data power less in our societies. And I, I think the more and more you see like people that have access and control and, and, and the skills can use, autocrats can, and populists can use the data to perpetuate their power and affect our democracies. And, and platforms can be used to manipulate our behavior through misinformation, uh, change the autoesteem of our children, uh, and, and many of the powerless are just fighting to have their basic control and access to their own data, such as is here very much around the world, the, the call from indigenous populations to sector level of data sovereignty as well. Um, I think data governance then becomes central to kind of build up on these balances, we address some of these balances. And I think the, the report make a great, great point in, in discussing the political nature of data governance. In terms of how to move uh, things forward uh, in terms of the voice and concerns of the global south, uh, first I think that uh, we, we have a long way to go into to, so that the kind of developing countries can really find their voice. Obviously we have the big models emerging as was presented from the European Union, from US, from China, etc. And, the, and there's no clear path for the global south on moving things forward. And I think that uh, uh, we've not done a service to developing countries when we discuss so many of these deep data agendas, uh, kind of privacy access, open data, AI, all separate. And I think we do need a more integrated approach. Uh, and this idea of a more integrated approach for data for development is something that we have been exploring and working for, for a while with our partners. And I think that the call that the report makes to um, build more of this co collaboration, I think is super important. Uh, as Susan said, uh, I think we do need a uh, better measured progress. Uh, also, we in IDRC, we are doing one thing that we have been contributing is to create a global data barometer uh, that are measuring uh, hundreds of indicators across uh, more than 100 countries uh, on, niche, on different issues and data governance is very central, not just a broad element, but as part of discussions on uh, how to govern data in, to achieve political integrity or public finance or company information and public procurement, et cetera. No, we need to also dig the, into the nitty gritty of the governance in health and climate, et cetera. To, to get things uh, where we want to go. Uh, connect to that, we need to build that into the different elements of the agenda and, and build capacity to global so I think that the end is the final message. I think we do need to, to build that capacity uh, in new areas such as responsible AI, user 
artificial intelligence. We have been doing a lot of that, and we are very much looking forward to continue to discuss with partners around the table and the audience in terms of way to move forward on this more coordinated approach. Thank you, Bob. Great, thank you very much, Fernando. Uh, next, uh, we have Lorraine Pershinkula, who leads the Datasphere Initiative at the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. Lorraine, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much, Bob. First, I'd like to thank the invitation to join this uh, stellar panel. It's truly a pleasure uh, to be here and discuss the, the UNCTAD report. What an excellent work uh, you've done with the report, Todd uh, and all who contributed to it. Uh, congratulations. It, it is a great read. I can attest to it. So I have three key messages. Um, the first one is we need to change our narrative. Uh, the narratives and the analogies that we have at our disposal are incredibly limiting. Think about data is new oil. They're also very polarizing uh, and quite frankly, uh, in my opinion, dystopic. Um, a world where we all bury, bury our heads in the metaverse before solving the issues of the real world or one where we see persistent mistrust between governments and engrossing unilateral measures cannot be our only options. We need better narratives. And the UNCTAD report raises this point. Um, it's that point of reframing that we also insisted upon in the report that we launched earlier this year. We need to talk about data. And we asked ourselves, how can we go beyond the dichotomy of free flow of data and data sovereignty and reframe this discussion? And the answer requires necessarily understanding first what our common objectives are. And that is what we're missing, that new narrative. And on that, we think that building on the concept of the data sphere can be very useful to understanding the space that we are immersed in and that we are co-building. And the rationale here is that there's power uh, to naming this new sphere of relations between data and human groups and norms so that we can then have a more holistic uh, narrative, uh, a more multi-stakeholder and inclusive narrative as well. And my second message is that we need to fill in an institutional vacuum, which is also a point mentioned in the report. The vocabulary, the research, the policy and regulatory measures related to data have evolved greatly throughout the last decades. In the benchmarking that we're currently doing at the Data Sphere Initiative, we have already mapped over 200 organizations working on issues related to data governance from all over the world and covering multiple sectors and types of data, personal and non-personal. However, what we see is a deeply siloed sector and community as well, from privacy experts on one side, trade experts on the other, cybersecurity, intellectual property, taxation, electronic evidence, just to name a few. And so how can we come together? Um, it's through innovative governance approaches that involve not only countries, but all stakeholders. And to do that, we need to fill an institutional vacuum. And here I'm not talking about a global supranational power or one organization to rule them all, but at minimum a space where we can come together uh, and think about data governance that we want to have in the world that we want to build. And my third message is we need to be bold and we need to be innovative. How we collectively govern the data, state, data sphere will strongly determine the future of human society in the 21st century and our capacity to deal with major global challenges such as health, energy, and climate change. We need to reflect on and implement new tools to harness the opportunities and address the challenges um, as, as innovative as the technological revolution around us. Those solutions will be legal but also technical. They will come from governments, intergovernmental organizations, but also private sectors and civil society, particularly from the global south. And the solutions will come in many shapes and certainly as mentioned by Claudio, they won't be a one size fits all model. We, but we need to bet on this diversity, to experiment with it and to build evidence on what works and what doesn't. So, Changing the narrative, creating a space for corporations for data governance innovation, experimenting new legal and technical solutions are all points mentioned in the report by Ontide. And those are exactly the missions uh, of the Data Sphere Initiative. 
So I invite you all to look at our website, the datastreaminitiative.org, which we are incubating uh, and engage with us as we embark on this journey to bring actors together so we can collectively build a, a better future. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Lorraine. Uh, we'll turn to our final panel speaker, uh, Stefan Verhust, who is the co-founder of the GovLab at New York University. I'm sure people are well aware of it. Um, please um, to remind everyone to send in your Q's and A's, or sorry, Q's, and we'll have the A's for you, hopefully very soon, uh, after Stefan's presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bob, and thanks for having me, and congratulations to UNCTAD for indeed uh, one of the um, um, superior reports on the topic of data and data uh, governance. And of course, uh, having a name ending with V means that uh, all the uh, uh, areas that I was hoping to cover have already been covered uh, by the previous speakers, uh, which, uh, by the way, I've learned a lot by just listening to all of you. And I think, again, congratulations to the uh, uh, organizers of this uh, panel to bring such a stellar uh, group together. Uh, but just a few areas, perhaps, of um, reinforcement and perhaps uh, complementary kind of uh, points of view. And so the first one is related with regard to what are some of the priority areas that we should uh, focus on and how do we uh, really indeed, uh, as was mentioned uh, by Lorraine, how do we go beyond some of the current frame of thinking? And I think the first thing uh, to reflect on is that what I really like about the report is that it's not just focusing on the risk of not of using data, which is typically how we approach data governance, but it also focuses on the risk of not using data. And from my point of view, one of the biggest challenges is not just to prevent misuse of data, but it's also about how do we prevent the misuse uses of data if we can't figure out an appropriate governance structure to actually do uh, so in a way that is responsible and trusted. And I think that has been the real challenge from my point of view in the current day and age is that as um, was mentioned by Torbjorn, we have anyway, an abundance of data, but we really as a society have not found a responsible way and trusted way to actually then reuse that data in a way that can solve societal problems in a more data-driven and evidence-based way. And that to a large extent is a governance challenge. And it's could say it's actually a governance failure to the fact that we have this asymmetry that we currently have between those that need data in order to solve societal problems and those that have data, but somehow we have not found a way to connect those two, i.e. the data holders and the data users or the data demand that could actually provide for societal value. And I think that's, anyway, if you reflect on what is really one of the remaining, well, not of, there are many remaining, but one of the, uh, 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 one of the most challenging uh, data governance uh, approaches, it's really to deal with that asymmetry that we currently have between those that have data and those that need data, and how do we go about this? Now, in addition, uh, to the data asymmetry, and by the way, the data asymmetry is more than just anyway B two B, or anyway B two G or G two B. It's actually at multiple levels, right? The asymmetry exists between the individual and those that have the data, right? Because the individual quite often don't have access to data that is collected about them, but it also exists anyway between B two B. But then it also exists, of course, from G two. Anyways, the rest of society, i.e., government has data about. Uh, as all and how do we provide access to that so that we also can, of course, increase the value of that data, but also the use of that data. But it also starts to anyway emerge country to country data asymmetries and how do we deal that? And we have seen many of that during COVID-19, for instance, that indeed there was an asymmetry in actually having access to data across borders that could help uh, nations uh, be more uh, prepared and responsive to how to deal with COVID-19. Now, um, that data asymmetry leads then to intelligence asymmetries, i.e., anyway, those that have actually insight to uh, uh, have access to insight versus those that don't have access to insight. And then also, of course, we have, in addition to that, we have information asymmetries, i.e., the fact that we just don't know who has data, <laughs> and we don't know, for instance, how insight has been generated. 
uh, is in itself an asymmetry. So that's one big area from my point of view where we need to make massive advances in the governance space. And it is related to, of course, two elements. One is access to data uh, that already was collected, right? It's not just about collecting more data, right? I think as already mentioned, there is actually a lot of data, but how do we provide access in a responsible way? And that, by the way, will require going to Lorraine's uh, demand for new framing, it will require data stewardship as a concept to really be established, i.e. what's your responsibility as a data holder to steward the data so that it's not just protected from misuse, but that it's also being provided to those that can use it for societal benefit. And I think that level of stewardship will become more and more important, and it will, anyway, it will involve a set of anyway rules and policies, but it also will involve a new profession of actually individuals within data holder organizations that can make that kind of assessment, but it also will involve new institutional structures, new partnership models, and new governance models for then accessing the data in a responsible way. The second element, in addition to access, is then of course, the reuse of that data for other purposes. Because one of the biggest challenges with regard to the existing governance uh, approaches to data is that most of those approaches are based upon purpose specification, i.e. you can only use the data for which it was collected. And uh, the real opportunity and challenge and headache, frankly, uh, uh, with regard to data in the current environment is that data that was collected for one purpose can actually be used for other purposes. And that's, of course, anyway, as Torbjörnsson was, uh, uh, Tor Torbjörn was saying, um, this is actually the real value proposition of data quite often. Uh, but as a, from a governance point of view, we really have not advanced the reuse and secondary use in really a meaningful way from my point of view. And that will require, by the way, new ways to identify additional secondary purposes that are legitimate. Uh, I think Susan was referring to the need to engage with the public at large, but one area that we really need to engage the public at large is actually to define what are those purposes that are legitimate for reuse, for instance, in a way that would provide for a social license to start reusing the data in a way that is trusted and responsible. So these are a few, anyway, high level reflections on A, I, I, I appreciate that the, the, the report takes stocks of those uh, problems, but B, that we also need to really start thinking about data stewardship. We need to start thinking about the social license for reuse of data. And obviously, Bob, uh, with regard to your uh, question to the panel on how do we make this inclusive and make sure that indeed this is not just a discussion that happens within the developed world or is being pushed by the developed world, we obviously need to anyway advance more inclusive governance. And clearly, this is not a topic that is unique to the data space. This has been a topic that has been discussed and happy to anyway share some previous work on that uh, issue of how do we make ICT or internet governance more inclusive. But I just want to highlight two elements that uh, perhaps would be uh, important. One is actually procedural equity, meaning how do we make sure that when decisions are made as it relates to data, that actually it's done in an equitable way across the decision lifecycle. And that means that anyway, the agenda setting needs to be done in an equitable way, voting needs to be done in an equitable way and so on. And so procedural equity and how do you do this as it relates to data and especially global data governance is something to anyway figure out. And I'm sure CG has an, a view on that. But then secondly, and then that's something that uh, Bob, uh, as you know, uh, we've talked about at length, we are in 2021. Let's start using data and the and online environments for governance in a more equitable way as well. I mean, I'm always surprised that we talk about in a governing of the internet without actually using the internet for governance in a more equitable way. And we need to innovate. And that's also where Lorraine was referring to. We need to really innovate and use the technologies that we have at our possession 
for actually more equitable kind of decision making. With that, Bob, I saw you got very nervous because I went way over time. Uh, but with that, a few reflections and happy to go into um, detail if, uh, uh, if anyway, um, um, if someone feels that is needed. No, no, it's always a pleasure to, to hear your points. And um, okay, so we have about eight minutes. Um, you know, I, I took, I mean, I heard a lot of very interesting things and I think everyone complimented, he com complimented, com com um, complimented each other very well and maybe complimented too. Um, but, you know, I, I, you know, I like this, this uh, point that Lorraine brought up on narratives and how current narratives can be dangerous. And I think it leads to uh, a question that we have in the chat, and that is, you know, this import substitution type argument uh, for development that, that you do here. And, you know, with China, you know, countries may look to China and say, well, they have a firewall, they have data localization, and maybe that's what's led to them creating these internet giants. And it's a very dangerous narrative um, that I think may be out there, but I'm curious, uh, you know, Torbjorn, when you, when you were putting together your report, did this come up? Thank you, Bob. I think, uh, no, I think our, our main goal here was not really to, to look at everything that exists and say, this is the way forward, but really to point to the diversity and the, the high level of fragmentation in the approaches that different governments are taking for various reasons. And, uh, and I think uh, from, from an individual's perspective, I, you don't want to be, and we've done those surveys together with CG, by the way, to look at how internet users are, are perceiving this, uh, this aspect. And, and people generally don't want to be surveyed neither by the governments nor by the private sector. And, and this is, so, so both dimensions here are, are important to keep in mind. Um, and, uh, but we also have to reflect reality. Uh, we may want to have a different type of world, but we have the one we have. So the question is, what can we do with those uh, existing players that we have in the, uh, involved in, in developing data governance now? And how can we make sure that we, we move towards a more constructive dialogue than trying to just look at, at the various deficiencies of each uh, different uh, players? I think some, something that uh, also to keep in mind, building on what Stefan said, um, the question of access. When we talk about the value of data, whether it's for social value or for private value, uh, just the data in themselves are not very useful. The question is how do you have the capabilities and resources to transform this data into something that is uh, intelligent or bringing value to, to society or to, to the uh, private sector. Uh, and uh, here uh, we need to go beyond the, the, the narrative of just having access to as much data as possible uh, because that may easily lead uh, government policy makes to think we need to keep everything we have in our borders because then we will become rich but that will not be an easy solution. Yeah, very good points. Fernando, I, th I think you wanna come in? I can, I guess, and, and just building on that, I think the great points, I, I totally agree. And, uh, and, uh, and going back to your point, Bob, on when we think about uh, when, when China entered WTO many, many years ago and how we thought that these would many people had the hopes that it would change China in terms of more democracy and other elements as well that I think was, I think people have very similar hopes for the internet in terms of how it would open up also different things. So I guess it's an interesting parallel between the, the, kind of the WTO and the internet in itself and how they created a different model that we see them now very closely building up partnerships naturally in Asia, in, in Africa, uh, showing how their system is helping them to develop and working closely with governments around the world to promote that, you know, in terms of, uh, and, and, I, and I guess it would be not productive on our side just to take that as, oh, that's bad, that would not be, a, the, the, uh, so I think that the, that the report points in the right direction that actually what we need is to do the evidence for what the model that would work best for different countries in the global south. Uh, and, and I think that uh, we are now at the point, kind of how many years after we started discussing parts of the social free trade, we have a, an understanding, a evidence-based approach to how we move forward, no? Uh, 
they are just starting to get there into the, this new conversation on the data and the digital economy it's, itself. And I think we need to really go deeper on creating that evidence of what works and how and how to 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 guide countries to, to suggest or to, to take an evidence approach in terms of what we know, what how can we do better by by constructing that body of evidence that's required to move things forward. Well, you know, we have another question here. Um, so, I mean, we know that there's many, many initiatives going on globally. They're really good initiatives, um, but you know that in, that aspect of international coordination it's tough. And uh, we have a question. You know, we have increasing geopolitical polarization. So, how does one create this in, an international forum to discuss? data, digital economy government, governance that really is inclusive. Now, the UNCTAD report has um, some suggestions. Um, I have my own perspectives on, uh, on how this could be done with my digital stability board concept, but um, who would like to, to take that question? Who would like to start? Uh, Lorraine, please go ahead. And then Susan. And that's a very good question, and it's in the core of um, of the discussions that we have ongoing in, in the data stream initiative. And I think it will necessarily go through um, a process of consultation to try to understand how this could uh, could be shaped. Uh, I don't think uh, a solution could come only from a multilateral perspective. It necessarily needs to be multi stakeholder, and it needs to be driven by by innovation and it needs to be agile and it needs to be scalable for us to think about what kind of uh, protocols can be used for different stakeholders, uh, for different sectors, especially because we won't be able to, to manage all of this issue under one single uh, um, um, uh, convention, let's say we will have we will need several tools uh, to in order to to implement this. And just to go back to the to the to the first question as well that I want to to bring a, a reflection. The danger of the narrative um, of data localization is that of someone that has a ha hammer and thinks that everything is a nail. Uh, data localization certainly does not achieve different policy objectives uh, concerning. Um, uh, evolving a, a cloud ecosystem or uh, or privacy concerns, and so for me, it's trying to think about what is the objective that we're trying to get, and seeing what are the best measures uh, that we have in order to get there. Uh, and so that goes through going through a process of evidence gathering, as as mentioned by Fernando, but also uh, a process of meeting with your peers and trying to understand what are the good practices that are out there. There's so many organizations that are compiling, and GovLab is one of them, so uh, different uh, resources and, and frameworks uh, that can actually uh, inform people on, on how to do uh, better uh, data governance and creating that space, whatever it is, uh, between different stakeholders need to necessarily be a, a, a place where we share experiences. And I guess it's uh, my my answer is uh, going in full circle. We need to understand what are the good practices and how we can draw lessons from different uh, uh, fields that have tried to do that. Climate is one of them. I would say that we're at least 10 years behind in terms of trying to, to cooperate in this space. So I do think that we need a process of evidence gathering to answer to the, this question and also experience sharing so that we can get there in, in institutional building oh, solutions. Sorry, Lorraine, I got to come in. You know, I've been a very terrible timekeeper. We only have a minute left. So Susan, um, can I give you 30 seconds and I, I'd yeah. like to give so in mapping, the final word. In mapping data governance for 51 countries and the EU, we found a lot of similarities in how nations govern data. Uh, the differences lie in the structures that they've created. Um, more, Very few nations have put in right, human rights and ethical guidelines, although that is starting to change. So there's a normative process that's going on. That said, um, um, I think it's really important that we acknowledge the truth, which is surveillance capitalism begins in the United States. Yes, it is companies instead of governments, but it is, uh, it will not happen until people realize that their data is an extension of themselves, as well as a unit that can yield economic and social and political value. I think that 
portends that we need a totally different approach to governing data at the international level. We need to think differently about what we're governing and how we govern it. I bet Stefan has something to say. No? You know what? I'm I'm going to let us go over, and hopefully we won't lose uh, our uh, our Zoom. <laughs> yeah, well, again, uh, this is a complex uh, topic, and again, Bob, I, I don't. Let, let's say let's keep this for another conversation, perhaps, Bob, uh, because I, I, I'm sensitive to the time. I think one of the discussion, just one element, one of the discussion that we do need to have, and I think is what is appropriate at the global level, what is appropriate at the national level. And typically, anyway, as you know, that involves at least an assessment with the types of problems that we seek to solve. Are they coordination problems? Are there problems with regard to normative human rights? Or are there problems with regard to managing a common uh, uh, good? And I think uh, framing it in those ways uh, might enable uh, global governance where appropriate. Uh, and I think that's another conversation that we need to have as well. Yep, we, we need to have continue to have more conversations. Okay, Torbjorn, uh, let me give you a chance to say some final words, please. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for these uh, wonderful comments. And I, what, what I like is that, at least in this group, there is a common uh, view that we need to do more in this area, at least, and, and that there is a, a need for much more discussion. We need more time. We need more opportunity for discussion. And we need to bring in the various perspectives into the same uh, discussion. We cannot just talk about this from a trade perspective. We cannot just talk it from a privacy and human rights perspective, etc. We need to come uh, to a new way to dealing with that. That's also part of the innovative needs. Uh, I think uh, in addition to the, the data sphere that is uh, being uh, promoted by, by uh, uh, IGPN, you have also calls from the statistical community to develop a global data convention. There was a recent paper from IMF that told them we need to do uh, something globally to deal with data. There, there is a tendency right now, I think there is a momentum and I think we should build on that. And uh, I fully agree with what has been said. It, not one single organization will not solve this, but I think ultimately, given that we're talking about governance and we know that there are already a lot of rules and laws in place by governments, governments need to play an important role in this dialogue. And there the UN can provide a global platform for that kind of discussion. But I am, I've been in the UN more than 20 years, so I know that it has its pros and cons, uh, but uh, it is still the most global platform that we have at our disposal for the time being. Thank you so much again to Bob and to everyone. And uh, I look forward to continuing this dialogue in various ways and form, um, depending on uh, how we can best move forward. Thank you so much again. Okay, and I'd like to thank everyone too. Uh, thank you, Torbjorn, for that great report and for presenting it. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for participating today. I think, you know, there is some, you know, um, we all have, we share similar concerns. I think we have different views on how to come together to address those concerns. And I think this is a dialogue that we need to have. Um, so on behalf of CG, thank you very much. I'll just point out that CG has two more events coming up in the near future. One on gender-based censorship and the silencing of voices in the digital spaces on November 25th. And then we have an event with Ch called China and the Global Economy where we will be uh, having a discussion with the Chinese ambassador to Canada. So please subscribe to our newsletter. And once again, thank you very much everyone for this great conversation. Bye-bye. Thank you.